Good afternoon, everybody. I'm delighted to see so many people already introducing themselves on the chat. I, uh, with great pleasure, welcome you to Developing Global Pharmacist Vaccination Health Travel Health Services. My name is Dara Connolly, and I'm your moderator today. And I am with you because I am the president of the community pharmacy section in FIP. And we have a fantastic uh, session this afternoon. I'm very excited to hear from our speakers. And it's something very close to my heart because very luckily we have been vaccinating here in pharmacies in Ireland. And I know that there are more and more countries around the world where pharmacists are helping their communities by being able to vaccinate. So in order to get things started, there's a few announcements, some housekeeping to get in order. So please be aware that this webinar is being recorded and live streamed via YouTube. It's good to know the recording will be available on the FIP website. You may ask questions, but the best way to do that is to put them into the, into the chat box, the question box provided. We'll get to as many of those as we can. And also, it may be that the answer is best given after the question has been asked or after the next speaker has spoken. So we'll just let that roll. You're more than welcome to give feedback to uh, us through webinars at FIP.org. And as always, FIP is a fantastic organization for pharmaceutical scientists, for pharmacists, educators, practitioners, regulators, everybody who cares about pharmacy and is involved in pharmacy and pharmaceutical science. So I would uh, welcome you to become a member of FIP and you will very easily find how to do that. So let's get on with today's exciting session. We will have Derek Evans, Carl Hess, Sheila Seed, and Larry Goodyear, and I will introduce each of them as it comes along. What we're about today is uh, my introduction, the role of ISTM, pre-travel consultation, education, and training. That will be from Professor Derek Evans. Professor Sheila Seed will join us to talk about first aid and medical kits. Mosquito bite avoidance for the traveler will be taken care of by Professor Larry Goodyear. And Professor Carl Hess will talk to us about food and water hygiene as we travel. There will be a question and answer session and then we'll have some closing remarks. And that should bring us up to uh, here in Ireland, uh, half past four. What we want to do today is see that there are learning objectives to raise the awareness of pre-travel consultation. We want to talk and to identify over-the-counter products, and we want to be able to compare and contrast classes of over-the-counter products as well. And what we want to do really is to showcase the collaboration with the International Institute of Travel Medicine through membership of ISTM and the completion of the Certificate of Health. So without further ado, I want to introduce you to Professor Derek Evans, and I have had the pleasure of working with Derek in the community pharmacy section. He is a specialist pharmacist in travel medicine who is the clinical director of his own consultancy in travel health. He has spent 25 years in community pharmacy environments working as an independent prescriber and at corporate level. He has been made a fellow of the Faculty of Travel Medicine of the Royal College of Physicians and Surgeons in Glasgow and a fellow of the International Society of Travel Medicine. Derek was the first pharmacist to be made a fellow of the Royal Pharmaceutical Society for Travel Medicine. Derek established his own consultancy to support travel medicine and provides a wide range of services to all healthcare practitioners and include clinical practice, medical information support, new product development, practice-based research and education. He has been an international conference speaker and author. His interests include post-exposure rabies management, water purification techniques, and developing the global pharmacy community into delivery of vaccination and travel health services. Derek, it's my great pleasure to introduce you to this afternoon's session.
Okay, uh, Dara, thank you very much for that uh, introduction and um, welcome to the global community of uh, Travel Health. It's so nice to see so many different people from varying countries ar ar around the world. Um, what the aim of today is recognizing that uh, travel medicine and travel health in pharmacy is global, but also to recognize the fact that not everybody can offer the same services in every single country. So we're going to be starting off on the, from the ground upwards, looking at services that every single community pharmacist can can be organizing and can supply in the practice of uh, travel medicine. And this will form the basis of a good quality service and a service which, which we want to maintain so that we get repeat um, customers and repeat travelers we can, uh, and we can develop our clinical skills uh, through something that, that the public love, which is loving to travel. So I'm going to try and move on to my next uh, first slide. There we go. So um, I want to start as we're a global organization and we work very closely with World Health. What do World Health think about pharmacy? Well, it's interesting that this definition came through um, as long ago as 2013 saying that pharmacists have an important role to play in healthcare, and it's much more than just selling medicines at pharmacies. And they, they went on to confirm and say that pharmacists play that integral part, and they recognize the part within the healthcare team of a various functions ranging not just from procurement, but also the supply of medicines to pharmaceutical care services. And it's that phrase there, which we springboard into giving vaccination and uh, travel health services. So the travel medicine services in pharmacy, whether we call it travel medicine, travel health, but globally, these are diverse and they range from a supply only function through a wide spectrum. And at the other end, we come out through independent prescribing and in and uh, self uh, 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 vaccinating. It is recognized and we recognize it ourselves within the profession that the majority of countries have restrictions on pharmacists prescribing and vaccinating. And often that function of prescribing and vaccinating remains with other healthcare professionals. And I would add the rider at the moment. However, for travel advice, it is often the pharmacy that the traveler, your patient will attend as the primary destination, assuming that pharmacists will be able to supply the advice and products to maintain their health when traveling. So pharmacy, we know, and we see it uh, around the world, is becoming more and more the first destination and stop and approach before people are visiting doctors for the advice on how to stay well whilst they're traveling. So we need a support system. And I've been a member and my colleagues have all been members of the International Society of Travel Medicine, which we shortened to ISTM. And within the ISTM, they have some specific goals which are very relative to what we're talking about today. First of all, is about educating healthcare professionals public health professionals, travel industry and traveling public about travel medicine. So that's within their own goal. And what the International Society of Travel Medicine have done, they have recognized the value of pharmacists and have produced um, their own pharmacist professional group within the membership of that as a community. The ISTM will also help us to develop guidelines for best travel medicine practice. And that will help and support all professionals with the design of a system that is consistent between everybody for safe practice standards so that we are all working uniformly, irrespective of our individual professions, to the same safe standard. Oops, sorry, a bit too far. And then finally, they will say another, their final specific goal is facilitating international contacts and collaborations between practitioners of travel medicine, health authorities, and non-government organizations. And the ISTM recognizes the value of all health care professionals equally, and they award an internationally recognized qualification 
called the Certificate in Travel Health, and that is open to all pharmacists, and pharmacists who uh, undertake that are regarded as an e uh, equal st status to any other healthcare professional. So ISTM, why should we bother with them? What type of education and training may they give? So specifically for pharmacists, where I think and I have found with my working with them is they produce a standardized system of guidelines and good practice. The, the training they, have, they allow follows no formal course syllabus. And whereas as pharmacists, we may think that's a bit obtuse, but they do recognize, therefore, their variations between learning in different countries. And therefore, the training will follow good guidelines and good practice, but is not restrictive to elements that cannot be covered because it's not available in a specific country. As I've touched on before, the qualification, the CTH, that is recognized by all healthcare professionals. And there is an ongoing community of travel health specialist pharmacists. It's already established, we're already there, and we're over 200 of us there, willing to provide support to other members and other, other pharmacists willing and wanting to undertake travel medicine. As part of your development, there's an established post-qualification support group for healthcare professionals, and that goes part and through the ISTM model. And we actually, actually produce a CPD and the whole CPD arrangement for ISTM, believe it or not, is actually run by members from the pharmacist practice committee because they recognize ourselves as having some of the best standards for training and education. So when we're doing a consultation, and as I said before, this doesn't matter what you can actually supply, you'll be undertaking a pre-travel consultation for uh, with each traveler. So the objectives of this pre-travel consultation are to firstly perform an individual risk assessment, then we can, will communicate to the traveller what would be the anticipated health risks according to their uh, country and of destination and matching that with the risk assessment. And then we and then finally, where, where we are allowed, we can provide risk management measures. Now that will be including immunizations. In some cases, you may be able to give those but certainly products and advice for the prevention of prophylaxis. And that is what my, my colleagues will uh, expand on further. So the first element within this consultation is the risk assessment, and it needs to be, record the individual patient's health background along with the trip itinerary, duration, the purpose and the activities. And we can record that while either electronically or using a pre-printed paper coffee. But there are some minimum things that do need to be included and things such as the past medical history and the age and the sex, the underlying conditions, allergies, medications. And also, importantly, now we're seeing special conditions in travellers. We're seeing more pregnant travellers, travellers with young children who may be breastfeeding, immunocompromised travellers, older age, recent medical conditions and surgeries. This is where pharmacy can really, really evolve. And in my personal experience of working with the other healthcare professionals, this is the one where they come to ask the pharmacist for help. What are the drug interactions here? What are the therapeutic problems that we may come with this patient who may be traveling? So the risk assessment, the trip details. So we'll be looking specifically at the itinerary the countries and specific regions within the countries. Is the patient and traveler going to be rural or urban? The timing, is it seasonal? Is it um, the time before departure? The reason for the travel, tourism, is it business? VFR stands for visiting friends and relatives. More and more we're seeing volunteering, education, and adventure and pilgrimage. And we next week we'll uh, be going and we're certainly looking at the Hajj at the moment. The travel style, the accommodation, the mode of transport, the insurance, and more and more people wanting to do special activities. They will maybe climbing to high altitude. They wanted to do the scuba course in warm water and who would not blame them? 
and the other ones such as uh, cruising becoming a very popular activity along with people wanting to do whitewater rafting and things like this and having uh, increased water exposure. Now this may seem daunting, lots of information and how do I manage it, how do I put it all together, but well, what we're saying is that there are some, you're recording these risks at the destination, but they can be easily achieved by accessing some of the free websites that provide the travel health advice. Now in North America we have the CDC um, based out of Atlanta, in the UK Travel Health Pro uh, based out of London, EDC for Europe and Smart Traveller for Australia are just some of the free websites that anybody can tap into and access. If you want to know a little bit more, a little bit more detail about why or the etiology of a disease or where it might be going and how do I treat it, then I would suggest you look at the CDC Yellow Book and that is an online travel book and most questions you will ever need to know about travel medicine will be accessible through that book and it is free. We move on to um, from risk assessment to risk management. So this is a part of the consultation which matches the information from the risk assessment with the specialist information from those sources I've just been discussing to initiate a discussion with the traveller. And this discussion will usually cover immunizations. Now you may not be able to offer them, but you can certainly discuss the importance of the immunization. And these will include both the routine childhood ones and also the travel health ones. It could be also to include the supply of the anti-malarial chemoprophylaxis. But more importantly, what everybody can do as a community pharmacist is looking at the prevention and self-treatable conditions using OTC products. And as I touched on before, these are uh, the uh, topics that my colleagues will be uh, discussing and uh, covering uh, in, in the uh, future slides. So the risk management, and my, my colleagues will be taking this further. So we'll be looking at vector-borne diseases what are the insect precautions? What type of insects may there be? And the bite avoidance products. The traveler's diarrhea, what would be food and water hygiene? How can I avoid it? How can I reduce and minimize the risk of suffering with travelers or diarrhea? And personal safety and hazards. How many, how many travelers will go away and they haven't got the right equipment for a medical or a first aid kit? And it, may, and it will be different and relevant to their trip. So if you've got somebody walking in a desert, you may need more blister plasters than you would be with someone who's doing a scuba diving course. And I'll leave my, my colleague Sheila to take more about that. One. These, of course, are not the only self-treatable conditions. There are others. There are the ones such as the water hazards and environmental hazards, as we've described, described before and also carrying medicines across borders. And this is an area where pharmacists have taken the lead with the ISTM and created a database of uh, medicines that can be carried or cannot be carried in accordance with international regulations for entry into specific countries. And that was set up and run through the uh, ISTM. So in summary, all pharmacists can be involved in travel medicine through the supply of products matching the needs of travelers' activities. Pharmacists are able to provide a pre-travel consultation service of assessment and management, highlighting specific risk areas. The ISTM is the international organization that supports the practice of travel medicine standards knowledge and education, and they have a dedicated pharmacist professional group. That group and the ISTM support the Certificate of Travel Health. This is the qualification that is internationally recognized for all travel health practitioners. Now, I was gonna say thank you very much for listening to, to me. I was, I was just uh, asked to provide the overview. Hopefully you guys have found that of some help and support. I'm now going to pass on to my colleague, uh, Sheila, and um, she will take on 
the next uh, the next session, which will be first aid and medical kits. So I'm going to hand back now to Dara. Eric, that was amazing. I think every one of your 25 years of experience uh, came into play in that talk. Fascinating. That was brilliant. Uh, and dead on time as well. Uh, colleagues, it's my great pleasure now to introduce Professor, professor Sheila C. Sheila is a professor and chair of the Department of Pharmacy Practice at MCPHS University and at the Worcester Manchester campus. She received her bachelor's in science and pharmacy from the Massachusetts College of Pharmacy and Health Sciences, Boston, master's of public health from the University of Massachusetts, Amherst, and doctor of pharmacy from the Idaho State University. She has been a faculty member at MCPHS since 2001. Prior to her appointment, she worked in the community setting and as a pharmacy officer in the US Air Force. Her areas of interest include public health, immunizations and travel medicine. She has been active in many professional organizations advocating for public health issues in pharmacy practice, including immunizations and travel health and related issues. Sheila, we very much look forward to listening to your talk. Thank you, Dara, for that introduction. Uh, next slide, please. Ruben. So I'll be talking about first aid kits for the traveler. Um, this is something that any community pharmacist can um, aid their travelers with uh, when they are interacting with them in their community pharmacy. Next slide, please. So every traveler, when they are traveling, should assemble a, a travel health kit. And you can tailor this to the type of travel that you have. So what their needs would be, and it may be different uh, depending whether they have some pre um, existing medical conditions or not. The type of travel, as Derek had alluded to, um, there's all different types of travelers. We have those travelers that are going on tours, or we have luxury travelers. We have travelers going back to visit family and friends, but we also have our adventurous travelers that are hiking through very rural areas. The length of travel also may determine how big or little your kit should be. Um, is it going to be a short period of time or is it going to be a long extended period of time? And our destinations, are we going to uh, cities? Are we going to rural areas? These are all things that will make you figure out what kind of tra um, travel kit you need to aid for the, your, your patients. Next slide, please. So you should have enough supplies. Um, to manage any pre-existing medical condition, if they have diabetes or some other medical condition, um, and you want to be able to treat any exacerbations of those conditions. Uh, you want to prevent any illnesses and injuries related to travel, such as, as we will get to later about uh, traveler's diarrhea, uh, but we all have some injuries, uh, blisters or cuts and scrapes. Uh, those are things that we want to make sure that we have in our travel kit. And, you know, any minor health problems, if you should have a headache that you might not be able to get uh, a OTC vac uh, medication easily if you're in a rural area. Next slide, please. So these are just some examples of what type of kit you can have. So the one in the middle is just a very small basic um, kit and you can go all the way to the right, which is a um, very extensive complex, has any kind of emergency that you could possibly think of. And those might be for our um, adventurer uh, travelers that will be in a rural area. Next slide, please. So you could actually help your patients put together their own kit, but what you really want to have are some Band-Aids, uh, some disposable latex-free gloves. So if you happen to have to wash out a wound that you want to be able to wear some gloves to do that. Uh, four by four gauzes are always needed um, and some cotton swabs. And you may need some tape to put on your gauze if you're um, mending a wound. Uh, we want to have some disinfectant. We want to be able to make sure that we clean any wounds uh, that we may experience. Um, antifungal or antibacterial spray or 
cream. Uh, so sometimes I like to actually recommend the small individual packets uh, rather than the big tubes uh, because they can actually stay cleaner um, if they're in those little individual packets. Um, those hydrocortisone cream for any of those um, itchy rashes that they may experience. Um, aloe gel for sunburns if they're going to some really nice areas with lots of sun um, and they happen to get sunburn because they forgot to put on their sunscreen, um, aloe gel is really great for sunburns to help take that burn away. Moleskin for blister prevention and treatment. Um, this is even great for uh, breaking in shoes when you're not traveling. Um, so this moleskin will be adhesed. Um, you can be adhesed is it to right to the skin of um, the, the foot area that may be, be chafed by uh, hiking boots or whatever, uh, just to prevent that blister from forming in the first place. Um, digital thermometers, um, if they should happen to have a fever. So uh, with COVID, uh, we wanna make sure that uh, if they have a fever that they can actually take their temperature to see in fact that they do have one. Uh, tweezers are always helpful for pulling out any kind of sliver that you may have or any kind of um, debris that may have gotten into um, a cut or a scrape. And scissors will be used for uh, cut, just cutting up the tape or if you need to cut up um, some other the gauzes that may be a little bit too big and then you can cut that. Um, if you're in remote areas, uh, you may want to consider having a suture kit uh, if you should happen to need to stitch up something. And you always want to have that first aid quick reference guide that can kind of give you the, the how to of what to do in case of certain um, injuries. Next slide, please. So the first kit, um, first aid kit should be readily accessible to the traveler. Uh, so you want to put this in the carry on bag um, and any liquids or gels still have to be within that three ounces or 90 mLs of um, the size limit. Uh, so the, I always have my first aid kits on my carry on bag and never check it. Um, as well as any prescription medications, it's really important that you counsel your patients that all prescription medications should be on the carry-on, never in the checked bag. Uh, you you want to make sure that the prescriptions you come with are in your carry-on and you leave that plane in case your luggage that you checked did not follow you to your destination. So we always want to keep our uh, prescriptions in their original pharmacy containers with labels that are clearly um, understandable. Um, you can, I tell my patients, you can bring your daily reminders with you, but don't have any pills in there uh, because you never know who is going to be in um, the immigration when you land at your destination. They don't like seeing things that are unknown. So if they're in their original pharmacy containers, um, it just will make it a much easier process uh, for your travel to get through the immigration process. You always want to have copies of prescriptions with the generic names uh, because many brand names are different in other countries. So the generic names are pretty much universal. You wanna have the dose and the directions. Should they happen to lose their prescription, uh, they may go to the pharmacy and um, they the pharmacist can help them with something that may be similar to that. And they can either direct them to a healthcare provider that they may need to have another prescription written, or if they're able to um, help them with a prescription that would be similar than to what they had at home. Control substances are a little tricky in many countries. And as Derek alluded to, the ISTM has a wonderful list of medications that are available um, to be brought in freely, but many countries really do restrict um, control substances coming into their borders. And they may need to require a physician to fill out some paperwork or have a letter of necessity. And some items may not be able to be permitted into the country. Uh, Japan, for example, they are not keen to having pseudo large quantities of pseudoephedrine brought into their country. Uh, so these are things that as the pharmacist in the community setting, you could actually look these things up for your, your patients. Next slide, please. So this is just uh, an example of what that first aid guide looks like and the moleskin that I had alluded to um, and the basic suturing kit. Uh, the moleskin is actually very, very good for even those uh, travelers that are on tours that require a lot of walking. So they're not going to a rural area, but they may need to have their um, 
feet covered so they're not going to have um, a blister to ruin their their well-earned vacation next slide please as far as prescription medications, so you want to make sure that you take um, your prescription medications that you take home on a regular basis. I wouldn't bring the 90 day supply that you may have, but I always tell patients to bring what you need for what you're going to be staying and for a couple of days extra because you never know what might happen. If they have been given any prescription for the treatment of diarrhea with a fever, such as ciprofloxacin or azithromycin, make sure they bring that with you. Um, I always tell my patients, if you come home with that, that is a good thing. You did everything I asked you to do, and you didn't need that to use that uh, antibiotic for your traveler's diarrhea, um, because it's better to have it and need it than need it and not have it. So I always we always send our patients off with either a ciprofloxacin or azithromycin. If they come back with it, that's great. Um, and malaria prophylaxis medications, if you are going to a malaria endemic area, you really want to make sure that you take that medication with you and take it while you're there. Um, and, and if you are going to areas of high altitude, such as, say, uh, Machu Picchu in uh, South America, uh, you definitely need to have that because that could actually ruin your trip if you were going to these beautiful places and you forgot to take your altitude sickness medication. It's always good if you have an extra pair of prescription glasses or contacts to bring those with you. If you happen to be whitewater rafting and your glasses flew off, uh, it, it's always good to have that extra pair with you. Um, and also epinephrine auto injectors if you happen to suffer from any sort of um, allergic reactions. And I would recommend bringing a couple because it only buys you a certain amount of time. Uh, so if you're in a more rural area where it's gonna take some time to get to some medical attention. Um, I always tell people to bring a couple so you're actually covered for um, any unknown um, delays in getting medical attention. Next slide, please. If you are a diabetic, um, it really is important that they do bring all the diabetic uh, testing supplies and insulin with them. There are various um, containers that you can actually put, um, that's that blue one right in the middle, uh, that you can put your diabetes um, supplies, your needles and syringes, and your insulin actually in a nice little container uh, that will, you know, prevent you from it rolling around in suitcases. You want to make sure that they actually bring their Lancet devices and their glucometers with them. And they should have a medical alert bracelet or necklace. And it's always good to bring a letter that says you're um, a diabetic uh, in case there's, you're bringing a lot of syringes in uh, and it might raise some flags. Um, it's good to have that. Yes, you are proving that you are a diabetic and you need these syringes for um, your insulin. It's always good to remember to bring batteries as well for all those devices. As far as over-the-counter medications, anything that you take at home on a regular basis, such as um, maybe acetaminophen or ibuprofen or aspirin uh, to treat uh, pain or fever if you are suffering from osteoarthritis and you take acetaminophen, um, you want to remember to bring that with you. Um, if you have any gastrointestinal issues, um, if you're having any upset stomach, watery diarrhea without a fever or constipation, um, you, there are medications that you can um, offer to your patients, such as loperamide for diarrhea. Bismuth subsalicylate is also another good medication for traveler's diarrhea, but it's also good for upset stomachs. Um, we, but we want to be careful of our patients that are allergic to aspirin, of course. We don't want to offer that to them. Um, and nice thing about bismuth subsalicylate is that's available in liquid and in tablets, so it's easier to travel with. Um, you want to bring some of those packets or tablets of rehydration salts for dehydration. So we, I always tell my patients there's uh, a couple of products that we have here in the U.S. that you want to bring those tablets with you and, and you put that in clean um, bottled water should you happen to get some traveler's diarrhea just to replace those electrolytes. It's nice to be able to have that um, so you can feel a little bit better 
can get back to enjoying your vacation. Um, some people have the opposite problem when they uh, travel. Instead of having diarrhea, they may get constipated. So you, a mild laxative is something that you can also bring along. And if they have an upset stomach, they can also bring some antacids. And a lot of these are available in multiple forms. I find that the tablets are easier to travel with. Um, so that's something that I always recommend to the patients is um, to avoid the liquids because you're getting into that uh, limitations that you have to have about how much liquid you can bring in. So the tablets are always a better, um, easier to carry with. Next slide, please. As far as some upper respiratory tract discomfort, um, you can bring some antihistamines with you. Uh, I recommend the non-drowsy uh, just because you can get a little sleepy during the day. You want to be able to enjoy your travel. Um, and you never know if you, there's different allergens in different countries that you may not be experiencing here, but they're really bothering you as you travel uh, to another destination. Uh, de decongestants as well, alone or in combination with an antihistamine is also um, pretty handy to have. Again, you want to watch to see if the country that you're going to will allow you to bring a pseudoephedrine product in. Cough suppressants or expectorants and cough drops are always handy um, if you should happen to have um, develop a cold uh, while you're on your, your trip. As far as motion sickness, we can always recommend products such as meclizine or diamond hydrate um, to help with that motion sickness. And there's also those other tips of, you know, sitting in the front of a vehicle um, to help them with those motion sickness issues. If they're having problems sleeping, so you're traveling and you're going through multiple time zones, um, you can take medications such as melatonin or diamond, diamond hydrate, uh, diphenhydramine, uh, now be careful with children with diphenhydramine because I always say they can have that, that opposite effect. So I don't tend to recommend diphenhydramine for children um, just in case they get that hyperactivity um, reaction instead of the sleeping. As I tell parents, that could be a very long flight if you're thinking that you're going to um, give your child diphenhydramine um, so they can sleep on the plane. Uh, I, I don't tend to recommend that. Uh, just a dryness, if you're on a long plane ride, uh, the saline nose drops or the saline eye drops will help moisten those um, mucosal membranes. Next slide, please. As far as um, some other things, uh, we can want to bring our antibacterial hand wipes or alcohol-based sanitizer. We, with COVID, we have all learned to carry their hand sanitizer. So if you don't have access to soap and water, the hand sanitizer is the next best thing. And you always want to make sure that you tell your patients that before they eat anything, they really should either wash the hands with soap and water or use the alcohol-based sanitizer um, to prevent that foodborne illnesses. Larry will go further into the insect repellent for the skin and the um, insecticide clothing or mosquito net nettings. You can actually buy clothing that's impregnated with permethrin. I always say the more money you want to spend, um, the longer lasting that permethrin impregnated clothing um, is, is good for. Uh, the bed net is also something that we would also want to advise our patients if they're not going to an air conditioned place uh, while they're sleeping. And then of course, sunscreen. Um, a lot of people will forget sunscreen, but we always want to have sunscreen with us. Um, and we always want to put that on whenever we're going outside. Uh, we want to use the water purification tablets if you're such in a remote area, if you're hiking in those remote areas um, and you, you don't have access to clean water. Uh, these water purification tablets are pretty handy. There's also a lot of these um, containers that will have filters in them as well that you can um, actually recommend to your patients. Uh, latex condoms, so for the prevention of STDs uh, is another conversation we have with our patients. And any personal safety equipment, such as bike helmets, I always tell patients, you know, if there are seatbelts in the car that you are at and that you want to wear that seatbelt, uh, the number one cause of injury in travel is motor vehicle and um, pedestrian accidents. Next slide, please. So as far as the diabetic, you want to make sure that they absolutely bring enough batteries for their meters and pumps and continuous glucose monitors. Uh, they want to bring that glucose monitor with them and a glucagon kit should they happen to um, need that uh, if they're in a crisis situation as far as their blood sugar. Uh, we want to also have that fast acting glucose tablets should they have their um, 
glucose, their insulin very, very low. We want to make sure that they can um, rectify that. Insulin infusion sets for the pumps and syringes, as well as lancets, um, and the alcohol wipes, if you don't have access to soap and water to, to cleanse the area uh, before you're going to be actually um, taking your blood glucose. And any test strips, make sure you bring more than enough test strips uh, with you when you are traveling. Next slide, please. And these are just some commercial medical kits that you can um, purchase. Um, this one with a dental medic is actually, this is actually a pretty decent uh, uh, kit to have if they happen to crack their tooth while they're out and about and they, they don't have access to a dentist, this will actually get them to, you know, cover the tooth so it can actually um, help them that they can actually eat still at, before they get to a, a dentist. I, Side note, when I was traveling in Ireland, um, I was eating lunch. I literally just got off the plane, grabbed some lunch, and I cracked a tooth. The first place I went to was a local pharmacy to ask them where a dentist was that could fix my tooth. And um, they brought me to a, a great place and was able to fix my tooth. But if you're in a rural area, um, you don't have that ability to do that. So this dental um, kit will actually just kind of make it a little filler if you happen to crack a tooth. Uh, and they also have like really, really um, advanced kits, also a clotting gauze if you happen to be bleeding and it needs to stop because you, the pressure is not really doing that. They have these clotting gauzes that will actually help um, stop the bleeding. Next slide, please. As far as documents, you want to make sure that you bring any vaccine records, especially if you need to show proof of vaccination, such as COVID-19, yellow fever, or the meningococcal. As we talk about um, individuals going to Hajj, um, they need to show proof of that quadrivalent meningococcal vaccine, um, copies of their prescriptions, as I had mentioned, any documentation of a pre-existing condition, such as diabetes, allergies. And if you can, it would be great if it's translated into the local language, but I find that Google Translate is a pretty useful tool. Um, any health insurance or supplemental vac um, vac uh, health insurance cards, if you have that. Um, and any emergency contact information, you want to give them the uh, country's embassy or consulate and the destination country um, that you want to give them that information as well. Next slide. And the pandemic is still with us, so and we can still counsel our patients on the need for COVID-19 testing and vaccination requirements. Um, there's many countries that still require a COVID test, whether it's a PCR or antigen test, that is something that you can help your patients with, that they get the right test. There's nothing worse than having the wrong test done and get to the airport and realize that they can't board the plane because that's not the correct test that is needed. Um, many countries uh, may require the vaccination of COVID. If not, then what are their entry requirements? Uh, there are many great websites that you can go on to. The airlines are pretty good, but also the country's embassies. They, they, a lot of them have um, COVID information that you can uh, give your patients that information. Many countries also still um, require some health attestations that need to be completed, and those need to be sent to the particular health ministry of the country. So there's lots of things um, that we can discuss with our patients, including if they had recently tested positive uh, with COVID, what is the entry uh, requirement for the entry into the country? Do they need a letter um, or a fit to fly letter from their physician? Many of these um, items can be purchased in a local pharmacy. Um, you can actually help your patient put together their own first aid kit, or you can actually guide them to which one they need. Um, and you can help them assemble it um, and purchase any other items that they may need while they're in your pharmacy. And we will be a provider of any accurate COVID-19 uh, recommendations for traveling to other countries. Next slide. You're muted, Dara. Okay. I beg your pardon. Sheila, that was absolutely fascinating. I can't wait to go back through the slides and just see that I have a full range in my community pharmacy for things that people might need and I personally will be taking on my next trip. So, no, that was fantastic. And I'm sure there'll be lots of questions for you in the Q&A after. So, thank you very much. Yeah.
So my next job is, here we go. Right, now we're back on track. It is my great pleasure, colleagues, to introduce to you Professor Larry Goodyear. He's a professor of pharmacy practice and was the head of the Leicester School of Pharmacy at the Montfort University in the United Kingdom from 2003 to 2015. His principal interest is within the field of travel medicine in which he is keen to promote the role of pharmacists. He helped set up Nomad Travel Medical Services in 1989 and was a director of the company for 25 years. He has lectured and taught widely on travel medicine to both health professionals and the public and has been invited to address both national and international conferences on the subject, as well as appearances on television and radio broadcasts. Related research interests include methods for bite avoidance and medical supplies for overseas travel. He is a fellow of the Faculty of Travel Medicine at the RCPSG, the Royal Geographic Society, and the International Society of Travel Medicine. More broadly, in his capacity as Professor of Pharmacy Practice, he has been involved in research and teaching on a wide range of issues related to the profession of pharmacy. Larry, it's great to have you, and we look forward to hearing your talk. I hope everyone can uh... Also a jazz guitarist. Okay, um, I'm going to be uh, t talking about first protection against mosquitoes, and I, I guess uh, I'll, as Sheila did, I'll ask for the next slide to move on. So um, this is the plan of the presentation. Um, many of you uh, listening today will be involved in supplying uh, repellents, at least from from your from. From your pharmacies and advising people on uh, ways to avoid mosquito bites, which is what this uh, this presentation is all about. And of course, we want to avoid bites from mosquitoes for two reasons: one, uh, because uh, of the reaction uh, that uh, that you get from a mosquito bite, which can, uh, in some cases, ruin a, a trip ab abroad, as, as many of us will know. Uh, and also, and very importantly, to protect against uh, and a, whole, a wide range of diseases, uh, which includes malaria, dengue, chikungunya, and so on, quite a, a long list. And to some of these, uh, like, like dengue and chikungunya, at the moment, there is no uh, available vaccine, although that, that might come along. So protection against the bites from mosquitoes then is a, is a key area that we can um, uh, help travelers. So I'm gonna address two things. First of all, the, the types of personal protection that you can advise upon. Then I'm going to look at look, repellents applied to the skin in particular, and look at this question that I'm sure some of you have been asked about, what is, what is the best repellent? What is the best ingredient in a repellent? And how do we measure whether or not uh, a repellent is efficacious? Um, so I'm going to be to walking you through um, those, those factors in terms of selecting uh, a repellent. Uh, next slide, please. Okay, so in terms of personal protection, we, we, we define it as three modalities. The first is, is putting a, a barrier between yourself and the mosquito, and, and, and one does that with um, nets, uh, so mosquito nets, uh, that you use on retiring at night and wearing clothing. So providing the clothing is thick enough, and it, it isn't always, uh, the mosquito won't be able to bite through it. Um, if your net is, is effective and treated with an insecticide, then uh, again, the, the obviously the mosquito can't get through. And importantly, if it's treated with an insecticide, um, if your hand rubs against the net at night, uh, the mosquito is unlikely to land and bite you. So uh, those are the two barrier methods. Um, the last, uh, Sheila was talking about in treated clothing and treating your clothing with insecticide as one has treated nets uh, can help, but um, the evidence is that, it, that even if you are wearing uh, a clothing treated with insecticide, there is still a fair po possibility that the mosquito may well bite exposed skin. So you still need repellents. Using the two together is probably the most effective way of approaching it. So that's the barrier. 
Now, the other modality, and some of you, again, will be involved in selling the products that, that cover this, um, is, are the area methods. This is where you release a vapor of insecticide again, all the, and, and mostly the insecticides are permethrin-based or analogs of permethrin. And these are released into the atmosphere, which will either kill uh, the mosquito, or at least make it very sick and it won't be bothered to bite you. And you can see those, uh, some of those products in that sort of right-hand corner. There's the, the famous mosquito coil that we light and is burnt. Um, and that, that can, uh, gives off a vapor of insecticide. Then you can see that in the bottom left, uh, there is the, um, the vaporizers you plug into a wall and a little mat or, or a well of insecticides gradually releases uh, this into the atmosphere. Using these things in an enclosed room, not recommended for the coils, uh, they can be carcinogenic if used for over a long enough period of time. Um, these, these vaporizers uh, are quite safe. You probably could have them on at night. Not recommended particularly if though, if you have asthma or some uh, irritable airways uh, condition, um, but otherwise they are effective. So providing the room is sealed, mosquitoes can't get in, then those area methods are gonna be very good. Uh, I'm going to spend quite a, probably the majority of this, this presentation they're talking about repellents because you, you, many of you will be supplying a range of these repellents uh, in, it, through, through pharmacies and it's useful to be able to advise on, on them. Now, what, what is in a repellent? Well, in fact, there's kind of three classes of, uh, I suppose, um, of products that can be in them. But what, look out for the uh, synthetic repellents. Of, of, uh, these, these are the three which are probably the most efficacious. A dichlotolumide DEET, Icaridin, which goes under various names of Saltadin, Picaridin, but Icaridin is, is, is one of the most widely used names, um, and IR3535. These are the three synthetic ones which are, uh, and I'll say a bit about the comparative efficacy in a minute. Um, the natural repellents, now there's a lot of natural volatile oils such as citronella do have a repellent activity, but it's very short lasting uh, and, you know, applying a fair amount on the skin, it might only last for 20 minutes, half an hour. So um, generally the volatile oil preparations uh, are generally inferior to, uh, to, other, to, to the synthetic ones, except for one natural ingredient, this is extracts of lemon eucalyptus. Um, uh, uh, PMD is the active ingredient within that extract and, and it's available sort of semi-synthetically as well. So if you see PMD, lemon eucalyptus, uh, then that is uh, uh, reliable with an evidence, and all these, these four have a reliable evidence base behind them. There are others on the market, uh, Skin So Soft, you might have come across, which is really an emollient, uh, a range of other volatile oils, uh, which are, we think, are certainly less effective, if effective at all. And then beneath that, which I'm not talking much about, are, are things we know to be ineffective, such as the, the buzzers uh, that emit a sound that are supposed to um, uh, repel an insect, um, uh, a mosquito, and those we, we think are ineffective. Um, also, um, the, um, uh, uh, the uh, vitamin B, uh, again, you're, I'm sure you've heard people come in and say use vitamin B as a repellent, and that is also really, uh, there is no evidence base behind that either. Um, so next slide, please. Okay, let's have a, a few more words then about the barrier methods. And I've mentioned some of this already, always treat with insecticide. Uh, long, very long lasting nets. The nets can have a lifetime um, of, of, of activity providing the, the fabric doesn't actually break. Uh, and there's very good um, evidence of, a, uh, of efficacy and disease prevention. Mosquitoes can adapt though. You, you've all heard of the um, the, the usefulness of these um, products in Africa in, in curbing um, the spread of malaria. Uh, they are becoming less effective, not because they're as often due to resistance, but because the African uh, mosquitoes tend usually to bite indoors. And because of the use of mosquito nets, they're biting earlier in the evening. So they get people before they climb under their mosquito nets. So there's a, 
adaptation there. Clothing, little formal uh, research. Um, I've researched this myself and people actually don't like wearing uh, a lot of clothing, obviously in hot climates, something like that on the right. So um, it's often impractical advice to say, tell people to cover up in these, in these hot climates. And I've talked about uh, repellent uh, clothing in uh, impregnation. Uh, next slide, please. Area methods. So here's the, the I've already mentioned these ones which there's reasonable evidence that they're efficacious. The, the vaporizers, and I've talked a little bit about those already and the, the, and the, and the usefulness, plug them in. If you're in a hotel room, uh, obviously there's no electricity supply, it's difficult to use them uh, before you retire. And if the room is sealed, then that will give a very high level of protection. Less uh, evidence, but some against spraying your room with a knockdown spray or using a citronella candle, uh, which you can burn Sometimes in the open air, perhaps uh, around a campfire, and it tends to cause a less uh, a collection of, of mosquitoes, shall we, say, shall we say. So that's the area methods. Right, let's have a now have a, a deeper look at, at repellents. Oops, um, beet. So well established, uh, you'll find a lot of products, wide spectrum activity, a lot of species of mosquito uh, will be repelled by DEET. Uh, there have been safety concerns. These are largely unfounded. So unless you actually drink the, the stuff, it's not going to cause you, uh, there's a little evidence that it actually caused you any harm. We even use it in young children where the risk is high. Um, sometimes that's a controversial issue, but that is true. So it's kind of gold standard. It's been with us since the 1950s. We know it's very effective and it's really the one we measure everything against. Uh, one of the more recent ones then, uh, Icaridin, which I told you about, um, quite similar to DEET, actually, uh, in, its, in its activity. And I'll come, I'll come on to what the formulation differences, which are very important. IR3535, you don't see a lot of products in the UK. It may, it may be more used in, in, the country, in, in, in other countries. Um, it's not, maybe not as effective against the Anopheles mosquitoes, which uh, transmits malaria. Um, and that, that, that's a possibility. So maybe avoid that one in, if you see it in ingredients for those people going to malaria endemic areas. Limited evidence, more limited evidence for, for PMD, another name that goes by citriodiol. Um, but it's probably, and, and I've done some work on this myself, which I'll show you in a minute, a similar dose for dose to, um, uh, to DEET. So we'll have a look at that. Um, and these other things I've been talking about, good evidence, but poor, for poor efficacy, in fact. So which of these is the best? Next slide. Okay, so you can, you, you can usually supply efficient, sufficient repellent on these, these ones that I've described as being effective to stop biting completely. And most users, um, will, and again, this is studies that I've personally conducted, will apply uh, if left to their own devices, which uh, one milligram per centimetre squared. So that, that, in terms of a liquid, that, that's ten, what people tend to apply um, before it starts to run off or the skin starts to feel too wet. So you find that the, the, the average application rate is one milligram per centimetre squared. Some species variations, but that, anyway, hold that in your mind, that's, that's what people apply. And in general, you will apply 100% with those effective repellents if you apply one milligram centimeter squared. What the key thing though, is how long will it be before you need to reapply the same dose to stop them biting? And this is where people say, well, I don't think this repellent is very effective because what you find is that that's the mean, but many people will, will apply far less than 0 0.1 milligram per centimeter squared. The, the repellent quickly stops working and they say, well, this, this, this repellent is useless. A lot of people have in their mind, I just need to apply it when I go out in the morning, I forget about it, like a sunscreen or something. That's just not true. It needs to be reapplied. And we'll, we'll, if you go on the next slide, I'll walk you through that. Next slide. This is how we assess it in the laboratory or, or, or in the field. It's simply sticking your hand in a cage of, well, simply, uh, of mosquitoes and measuring how long it takes for them uh, to bite. So it's time to the first, intra, the first bite of a mosquito. Next slide. Uh, this is an important slide, and again, it's work that I've done on comparing PMD to DEET. And what we can see is that one milligram per centimeter squared 
uh, the two products are very similar. But this is the key thing. Um, PMD is really only available at a, at a maximum dose of about 20%, yes? It's certainly in the UK, we can, uh, we can um, uh, purchase DETA at up to 50% or sometimes higher. So the message here is that um, one milligram uh, applied, applied in the normal dose, one milligram per centimeter squared, the two are comparable, that's around 30% DEET, 20% PMD. But if we purchase a higher dose and we apply at the rate that most people apply at, say 40% DEET, then that is far superior, as you might imagine, to the maximum dose you can get of PMD, which is 20%. So the dose, the look at how much is the concentration, because that is key to how long it's going to last in practice. However, next slide. Um, there are many variables that affect the longevity of a repellent in practice. How much is applied, we've seen already, but once you've applied it, then uh, the various factors can affect how long it will last in the field. This is in the laboratory, it, 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 the, the things that I've, or graphs that I've just shown you. So rub off and perspiration, if there's a lot of mosquitoes around, high biting pressure, you might find that it lasts, it doesn't last as long. In some individuals are more or less attractive. The ambient temperature and air turbulence also affect and mosquito species. So there's so many different variables that we can say, well, how can manufacturers claim a length of action? Next slide, please. Um, and the, the answer is that I would be, I would never say to anyone uh, or the, the, the lay, uh, when the label says, as they often do, lasts up to 24, 12 hours, the impression is it will usually last you 12 hours. It won't. Um, uh, if there's a moderately high mosquito biting pressure, even with relatively high concentration to repellent, you're looking at three to four hours probably. So um, what active ingredient is best then? 50% D is still the first choice as I've, as I've shown. Um, and there's a, a large number of, of studies that, that probably support that. And that's the, what we recommend in the UK. Um, caution, if the manufacturers claim it lasts 12 hours, uh, actually uh, the laboratory tests for licensing are done at two milligrams per centimeter squared. So twice the usual application weight. Um, and we, I've said, told you many variables affect longevity. My advice then is, really ignore the labeling in terms of 12 hours, is re reapply if the mosquitoes take an interest or start to land, uh, certainly if they start to bite. That is really the signal that it needs reapplying. That could be uh, six to 12 hours. It could be uh, two, one or two, or three or four hours. So that is the, the message that I hope to take away. Next slide, please. Here's the general user advice points then, really to my last slide, use all three modalities against mosquitoes. For repellents, then you may need to reapply more frequently than the manufacturer's instructions. If it appears to work, work in one destination, it may not be as effective as another because there are species differences in, in sensitivity. And in particular, that if, if there's a lot, a lot of more, the more mosquitoes there are around, essentially the higher the chance of getting bitten despite uh, wearing a repellent. Remember, this is all uh, to reduce the risks of biting. Nothing uh, is going to be completely eliminated in terms of repellents anyway. Okay, I think that's my last slide, is it? No, that okay. was fascinating. Thank you very okay, much. Thanks. I think it always goes to show we need as scientists to understand our enemy, and the mosquito is certainly our enemy when it comes to this. That was fascinating. Okay. Thank, Thank you very much. So colleagues, I'm delighted to present our last speaker for the session this afternoon. Uh, Dr. Carl Hess is an Associate Professor of Pharmacy Practice and Director of Community Pharmacy Practice Innovations at Chapman University School of Pharmacy in Irvine, California. Carl earned his PharmD from the Massachusetts College of Pharmacy and Allied Health Sciences in Boston in 2005, 
and subsequently completed a PGY1 community pharmacy practice residency at the University of Southern California School of Pharmacy in 2006. Dr. Hess lectures on a variety of subjects on health care delivery, self-care therapeutics, immunizations, and travel, health, and medicine. Carl's areas of academic and research interests include innovative community pharmacy practice services, travel, health, and medicine, vaccines, and self-care therapeutics. He has given various local, state, national, and international education programs on these subjects, and is specifically interested in the national and global advancement of pharmacy-based immunization and travel health services. Carl, you're very welcome to our session this afternoon. Thank you very much for that and uh, for that uh, uh, excellent introduction. Um, if you could move to the next slide for me, please. Okay, so this is the title slide. So I'm just gonna really be talking today about food and, and water precautions and what we can do as pharmacists uh, in terms of counseling, because that's really, I think, the cornerstone of, of what we can do in this area, as well as focus on some non-prescription products and strategies uh, around these areas. Next slide, please. So as you can see on the slide, there are a variety of food and waterborne illnesses that abound um, when someone travels uh, internationally, particularly to uh, developed or under-resourced areas. Um, the ones that I've included on the slide here, traveler's diarrhea, hep A, uh, salmonella, uh, serotype typhi, which was which is the bacterium that causes typhoid fever, polio, and cholera, tend to be the most common ones. And also, all of these, with the exception of uh, traveler's diarrhea, uh, tend to be uh, vaccine preventable. So uh, we don't have the time today, unfortunately, to kind of go into all the vaccines and such. Um, but I do want to look at these kind of lumped together, so to speak, uh, in terms of general strategies, uh, treatment recommendations, things that we can be doing, recommending. Uh, for our travelers, but hopefully the maps at least give everyone here um, uh, some appreciation for where the risk is at. And you know, generally speaking, the, the darker the shade of the country or region, the higher the risk of disease. Uh, next slide, please. So a lot of risks for uh, food and waterborne illnesses in general. Um, and so from a review of the literature, you'll tend to find uh, what's listed on the, the slide here. Uh, so things, uh, as I mentioned on the previous slide, travel to developing countries, um, but also individuals who, who might be more adventurous in their travel. Uh, they, they may have an idea of where they're going, in the, you know, may not have a, a general idea, a good sense of where they may be uh, traveling to in the countries. They may be traveling in rural areas. They might be even a long stay traveler where their adherence to a lot of food and water cautions that I'll talk about tend to decline. Um, but we would generally lump those in as adventurous type travelers where the risk of some sort of food and waterborne illness increases. Um, we also need to be very mindful of VFRs. Uh, VFR is a term that is commonly used and recognized in travel medicine. It stands for visiting friends and relatives. Uh, so these are individuals that uh, you know, have grown up in a developed country or, or first world country, whatever you want to call it, and are, are going back to visit friends and relatives from their origin country after some number of years uh, being away. And the risk here is that um, these individuals may, quote unquote, fall back into their uh, behavioral patterns, habits, uh, eating habits, drinking habits that, they're, that they had when they were younger and they lived in country um, and thinking that they may be protected because generally speaking, at least from my experience in practice, the, the common response from a, a VFR traveler is, well, I, I didn't really get sick when I was a kid. I don't remember getting sick at least. So I don't think I'll be uh, in any danger this go around. So um, that's not necessarily the case. Over time, the body has kind of changed its gut microbiome um, and that uh, introducing new microorganisms and foods in the destination country may, may again upset that balance and lead to uh, diarrhea or stomach problems. Uh, travel during warmer months, travel during or after the monsoonal season where there's you know, a lot of standing water potentially nearby, a lot of heat and humidity. These are just generally good breeding grounds for bacteria, viruses, and, and other parasites to grow and multiply. Uh, we talked about long stay travelers, but uh, as pharmacists, we also need to be looking at uh, patient's medication profile. Uh, so using things like proton pump inhibitors, 
uh, histamine two receptor antagonists like famotidine or, or pepsid, uh, even antacids like calcium, all of those are going to increase the pH of our stomachs. Uh, and, and when we do that, we lose that first layer of protection in our stomach of that acid. Um, and so those, these individuals might be more susceptible to uh, bouts of uh, food and waterborne illnesses, whatever they may be, because that acid is no longer present. So in these particular cases, um, we want to make sure that the travelers are well aware of what they can be doing, um, both from a non-pharmacological standpoint with uh, choosing better foods to eat and, and things to drink, um, as well as being, you know, maybe a little bit more strict on when to use medications. Uh, in addition, individuals that are immune suppressed, either by uh, virtue of taking an immunosuppressive medication or having an immunosuppressive condition um, may also be at increased risk because their body naturally does not have the, the antibodies and the immune system to fight off uh, bacteria, viruses, and parasites that uh, other healthier individuals may have. So we really want to make sure that these individuals are also well aware of their risks and to counsel them accordingly because their outcomes may be even more severe uh, than, than someone who is otherwise healthy. Next slide, please. Um, so some measures travelers may take to um, uh, try to avoid or limit food and waterborne illnesses. Uh, these are all kind of uh, misnomers and things. Uh, so for example, using tap water to brush the teeth, even a, a small amount of water can, contains million, can contain millions of uh, pathogenic microorganisms, which can cause illness. Uh, similarly, drinking fruit drinks that might be uh, diluted with water, uh, with ice, ice is just frozen bacteria or, or tap water that might be uh, not contaminated or might be um, uh, not cleaned or, 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 or um, you know, hygienically prepared. That may, may transmit bacteria that way or illness that way. Improperly steaming shellfish, um, assuming that if you're staying in a five-star hotel, uh, that you're going to have safe food and water. Um, that's not necessarily the case. For example, typhoid fever we know is a disease that's transmitted from person to person. So if that individual who was preparing your meal forgets to wash their hands after using the restroom, uh, they can easily transmit salmonella to your food and you can get sick that way. Uh, so you still wanna take very strong precautions uh, when um, staying in you know, five-star accommodations, quote unquote, or uh, higher levels of stay. Uh, fruits and vegetables. Um, being peeled by others. The peel acts as actually a nice barrier for organisms from getting in. Um, though you do need to be careful if you buy fruits uh, and vegetables at stands at marketplace, uh, sometimes just anecdotally, patients will report um, uh, breaks in the integrity of the skin or the peel uh, with the, the vendor potentially injecting water into the fruit or to the vegetable to make it way more. So you have to spend more for that. Um, and that water may just be tap water and causing um, illness that way. And then lastly, eating salads. I think individuals feel salads are generally healthy and they certainly are, but you know, uh, generally speaking, they may be washed in tap water. Uh, they may be dried on a towel. These, these things might not be cleaned properly, the, the countertop, et cetera. Um, so salads tend to, should be things that also should be avoided. Uh, next slide, please. Um, so I feel these, these two quotes here are um, particularly relevant for our discussion today when it comes to food and waterborne illness. The first one's from Voltaire, common sense is not so common. Uh, and the second one from Stephen Covey, who's kind of a, a marketing and business guru here in the States, uh, who says that what is common sense isn't necessarily uh, common practice. Um, and, I, and I think these are, are relevant because while Generally speaking, I think we all feel we have a good idea of what we should be doing when we travel and making sure that we're, we're eating safe foods and, and drinking safe you know, beverages. I think there's also something just about the, the act of traveling where it's almost like a, a suspension of disbelief where it's not gonna happen to me sort of thing. And things like traveler's diarrhea tend to occur in one in, one in two individuals, so very high uh, attack rates, if you will. So I think it's really important from a counseling standpoint that even if patients may feel, yeah, they know what they're doing and, and they're prepared or they've traveled before, um, that we need to make sure that we still ingrain these quote unquote common sense practices into them so that they're, they're safe while they're traveling, they can enjoy their trip, they're not stuck up in a hospital somewhere or have to be uh, airlifted home. Next slide, please. 
So this is where a lot of the, the counseling comes in. Uh, I'm not going to go through um, all of them. I've kind of listed them in a do and do not type of a list. But generally speaking, the do's making sure that you know, any food that should be warm or hot when it's served to you is actually warm or hot when it's served to you, like meats, chicken, uh, fish, that sort of thing. Uh, if it's cold, if it's lukewarm, that's something that it, it something that should be sent back because it might have been sat out for too long. Um, peeling your own fruits and vegetables. Again, that peel acts as a natural barrier. Um, drinking maybe more hot beverages, coffee, tea, uh, beer, wine, those sorts of things. Anything that's carbonated tends to uh, take out the uh, bacterial contamination risk. And then most importantly, uh, using a bottle of water with a safety seal still on that. That's, that's really important. Sometimes that safety seal might be loose. It might be just filled up with tap water uh, to get you to buy a, an expensive bottle of tap water. But you do wanna check or counsel your travelers uh, to check the integrity of that safety seal to make sure it's tight. Uh, to make sure it's an actual bottle of water uh, from you know whatever uh, company is selling it, and then the various do nots on the other side. But you know I'll leave this to to everyone for reference. But these are really good points, um, and you know you can go into depth with them. But I think it's also important when you're talking to your patients to get a really good sense of what they'll be doing, where they be well, the, where they will be going. Excuse me what they plan on eating and drinking their sources of food and, and, and beverage so that you can more specifically tailor the conversation to them. Uh, next slide, please. Um, so this is also a, a graphic from the CDC. Um, I have found in practice that, you know, as I talk to my patients about these various foodborne illnesses, mosquito-borne diseases, um, et cetera, um, travel risks, COVID, you know, the list keeps growing with, with uh, international travel, that it's a lot of information overload. So I like to include pictures and graphics into uh, my counseling sessions with patients. And this is kind of a quick and easy one to show individuals um, who, who might be better visual learners than, than auditory learners, uh, safer foods to consume versus foods that perhaps are not as safe to consume. So the stuff on the left, as, as you can see, well-cooked steak, uh, grilled vegetables, hard-boiled eggs, uh, canned bottles of soda, bottles of water, um, pasteurized milk, much safer to eat than, um, it's kind of an interesting plate combination of st steak and eggs I get, but I don't know where the sushi and the cheese comes from that just seems, screams a stomach ache to me, but you can kind of see examples of good and bad. And a graphic like this might be useful to you in your own practice when talking to patients. So at least you can point and show them um, what you're, you're talking about and why a little bit more. Uh, next slide, please. Um, so some tips for drinking and using water. Um, so patients should really be counseled to only drink or use water that's been bottled, um, as we've been talking about, but you can also boil the water for a couple of minutes to kill off bacteria, viruses, and parasites, uh, or potentially even treating it with uh, chlorine tablets, iodine tablets, something like that. That goes for brushing your teeth, making ice cubes, really in places where you, you question whether the, the water is treated or not, whether the tap water is contaminated or not. Um, and I generally in practice like to err on the, the side of safety uh, and, and conservatism so that our patients don't get sick while they're uh, traveling. Um, bottled water sources, international brands that everyone recognizes like Evian uh, are, are safest to use. Um, and, and it's a, probably a good idea to, to carry that safe water with you. You don't necessarily need to pack it and take it with you. The TSA, at least here in, in the States, would probably confiscate that from me. Um, but buying it in country, taking it with you so you have a source of water is, is very important. Um, some other just kind of common sense uh, or, or maybe not so um, uh, common sense uh, do nots. Uh, the, the water that might accumulate in wet cans or, or bottles kind of in the lip of the uh, can of soda, that is something that you would probably want to dry off with a towel before consuming because that may be uh, tap water, it might be ice that has been melted and still has bacteria in it. Um, chlorinated water, uh, chlorination is one way to uh, decontaminate water and I have a reference slide uh, in the next slide or two on that, um, but chlorination is, is kind of a dose dependent thing. And if the water is murky or cloudy, then that effectiveness is also further uh, limited. So just because the water is, is chlorinated or has a tablet or two of chlorine in it, doesn't necessarily mean it's safe. 
Um, and, and things like fruit juices as well, um, just because it, it, it comes from a sealed container, it may be diluted with water. Uh, alcohol, like um, liquor, uh, vodka, rum, uh, whiskey, my favorite, doesn't necessarily make the, the beverage safe if you're having a mixed drink, unless you're, you're drinking you know, straight ethanol, which you probably don't want to do in the first place. Um, so alcohol by itself, you know, uh, liquor um, in particular is, is not um, an effective, you know, antimicrobial agent. Um, you know, it's, it still is something where it's a potential source um, for, you know, the ice, at least in the drink, those types of things might render it um, uh, infectious. Um, as I mentioned, water, if it's not readily available, boiling is probably the easiest and the safest method, generally a minute or two, but at altitude, just keep in mind that uh, virus or that water will boil at um, a lower temperature. It takes, high, it takes a longer time to boil at, at higher altitude, excuse me. Um, so if you're over 2000 meters camping, trekking, hiking, that sort of thing, uh, you're, you're gonna need to spend more time boiling your water. And I've included a link here down at the bottom in, in the case of, of an emergencies, making safe water. Um, next slide, please. Um, so just some tips um, uh, for disinfection. This probably is more relevant for uh, your, your backpackers, your campers, your uh, adventurous travelers, people that might be uh, doing remote field work or um, disaster relief things. Um, but you can kind of see the, the pros and cons for each. Generally speaking, heat is going to be the, the easiest disinfection technique um, because you can you know, always make a fire, I suppose, uh, or bring a source of, of fuel like propane with you to, to boil, but that does add weight to the pack. Um, other methods that patients will use commonly is filtration, um, but you do need to be mindful of the uh, type of filtration and the, the sensitivity of that filtration um, because if you're trying to get out viruses, uh, for example, uh, you may need a more ultra filter method versus uh, something that you may have purchased. Um, and then things like ultraviolet tend to be uh, much more expensive, but we'll get at those uh, smaller pathogens. But just kind of a, a simple pros and cons list here. Next slide, please. And then uh, here, just giving you a sense of the uh, level of filtration that you would need. So as you can see, as the size of the organism increases from viruses to larvae, the specifications for filtration go from, you know, you know, ultra filtration all the way down to, you know, basically any sort of micro filter, probably even uh, cheesecloth could get out uh, eggs and, and larvae if it's filtered through a couple sheets of that. Um, but you'll, you'll see that, you know, if you're worried about bacteria, you're gonna need a certain size of microfiltration, uh, uh, cysts, et cetera, a certain size of, of microfiltration. But if you're talking to your patients or you're reviewing the packaging with them, you do need to keep in mind um, the, the labeling here. There sometimes will be labeling for absolute filtration or nominal uh, filtration or pore size. Absolute really refers to, um, you know, if it has an absolute filtration of one, for example, with these oocysts, then it'll filter everything at one and up that's bigger. Uh, whereas a nominal pore size allows for a standard deviation of air somewhere around 20% or so of, of things um, to, to fall through. Um, and as your need for filtration increases, if you're trying to get out viruses, um, these filtration methods are going to be a lot more expensive because it requires more pressure. It takes more time to, to filter that um, and so that both of those things equate to um, higher costs, but both the, the sources of filtration or the methods of filtration, as well as this uh, chart uh, is available in the CDC Yellow Book, which I think is a really great reference for um, everything that we're talking about here today. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, so diet, just quickly, uh, we wanna recommend an age appropriate diet. So just simple foods. Uh, things that aren't going to upset the stomach. So no fatty, spicy, sim uh, simple, sugar-rich foods, heavy foods, caffeinated products. That's all going to aggravate the, the stomach. Um, really more bland solids, crackers, bread, cereals, rice, uh, and Sprite, ginger ale, these types of things to help settle the stomach. So very helpful to recommend these uh, during your counseling for, for patients if they do get sick. Hopefully they do not. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, we do have a couple of non-prescription medications out there. 
uh, in the United States, at least, we can use them uh, on label for a max of 48 hours before the person needs to be referred for, for treatment. Um, but you see our two options here, business subsalicylate, uh, the brand name of Pepto-Bismol, which I'm sure everyone's familiar with, the uh, pink tablets and liquid, and loperamide or Imodium, the brand name, which is available in a lot of different dosage forms uh, as well. And you can see the different dosaging. You, know, you can go up a little bit higher on Pepto versus uh, loperamide, where you're limited to uh, eight milligrams a day. But these are two uh, self-care options. Uh, next slide, please. So business subsalicylate, I tend to recommend a little bit more um, because it does have antibacterial and anti-secretory effects. So when you take this internally, it separates into bismuth oxychloride, which has some uh, antimicrobial properties to it, uh, can help fight the underlying infection, uh, and salicylate, which will help to reduce fluid and electrolyte loss, not to the extent that loperamide will by, by slowing down the gastrointestinal tract, but, um, but enough to help reduce symptoms and, and those types of things. But there are a lot of uh, cons associated with that side effects, as we know, uh, tinnitus, dark tongues, um, uh, dark stool, um, these types of things. Um, if a person is taking aspirin for cardio protection, we have to worry potentially about additive salicylate toxicity and maybe getting to tinnitus a little bit quicker. Um, people with aspirin allergies can't take it, lots of drug interactions. Um, and obviously in, in children under 12, uh, they should not be using it because of the risk of uh, Rye syndrome. So next slide, please. Uh, most people like to go with loperamide just because it works quicker, it's faster acting, and it stops the diarrhea. It helps people kind of move on uh, with their travels. Um, and that's because it's, it's, an, it's a, basically a third or fourth cousin to morphine. It's an opioid agonist. Um, so it helps to reduce um, gastrointestinal uh, transition. Doesn't really penetrate into the central nervous system. Um, but the concern here really is because it's holding everything in the gastrointestinal tract, any sort of bacterial, parasitic, or, or, or viral um, infection might worsen. Um, so we see reports of toxic megacolon, uh, pseudomembranous colitis um, uh, occurring with uh, overuse of loperamide. Um, and, and when patients have very high fevers or blood or mucus in the stool, uh, we shouldn't be using that at all. That's a sign of dysentery um, and, and really worsening of the, the infection would occur um, if keeping it in, 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 in the gastrointestinal tract with loperamide. Um, so next slide, please. Uh, another option might be oral rehydration therapy. In addition to producing stool um, during episodes of diarrhea, we're also worried about the, la the loss of fluids and with the loss of fluids, the, last, the loss of uh, electrolytes, uh, sodium, potassium, chlorine. Uh, so these are available commonly over the counter, these rehydration salts. Um, so it is really simple to, to um, use and dissolve a packet in a liter of water. Um, and it's appropriate for mild to moderate diarrhea loss, fluid loss due to cholera. You just wanna make sure that you're mixing it within a, a source of potable water, drinkable water, um, so that the infection doesn't uh, continue. Um, the, the internet, Google says that you can also make this available at home uh, using six teaspoonfuls of sugar, half a teaspoonful of salt and mixing in a liter of water. Traveling, that might be a little bit difficult logistically. Um, so it's probably easier just to take the packs with uh, in the case that rehydration is, is necessary. And that's one of the biggest complications of the diarrhea is the loss of fluids and the loss of electrolytes. Next slide, please. Um, I think it's also really important as, as kind of we come to the end to talk about the risk of um, antimicrobial resistance uh, within travelers. So there is a risk of extended spectrum beta lactamase producing enterobacteria in, in travelers. Um, and, and you can see, you know, on the, the graphic on the, the left here, this was a review study looking at the prevalence of um, ESBL um, in, in, you know, countries comparing it to CRE, which is um, which is, oh my goodness, I am blanking. It is um, another form of resistant bacteria. It'll come to me, I'm sorry, the name. Uh, and then MRSA, methicillin resistant Staphylococcus aureus. Um, but there is a rise in cases of ESBL amongst travelers. And so we're concerned about that spread. We're concerned about travelers picking it up, bringing it back in home country, making it harder to treat these infections limiting the use of um, antibiotics in country. 
Um, and then this, the graphic on the right here, this was a study done looking at risk factors that, um, that lead to the acquisition of um, ESBLPE in, in travelers. And this study found um, geographic region is probably the number one. So you can see these maps kind of correlate with one another with the Indian subcontinent and Asia being the highest risk areas, um, but also having traveler's diarrhea use, and using the antibiotic for traveler's diarrhea also increase the risk. So for travelers going to India, for example, who had traveler's diarrhea and who used an antibiotic, their risk was 80% um, versus if they didn't have traveler's diarrhea and they didn't use an antibiotic. It was still you know, a quarter high, but, um, but, but much less than 80%. Other things like pre-existing bowel disease uh, and increased age are also um, uh, risk factors for this. Uh, next slide, please. So the question then is, do we prolax or not? We have a couple of options over the counter. Uh, so the first might be with bismuth subsalicylate studies in uh, Mexico and Latin America has shown that a couple of tablets uh, QID or a couple of ounces QID can reduce the incidence of uh, traveler's diarrhea by up to 50%. Um, however, we do have to contend with the side effects and the issues associated uh, with use of that medication uh, routinely and they need to take it for the duration of that trip, which might be uh, an inconvenience for them. Um, perhaps more popular are, are probiotics. Um, these are widely available over the counter. Uh, and while there aren't really as high of safety concerns with them as bismuth subsalicylate or other medications, um, the efficacy is, is still somewhat questionable. Um, unfortunately, clinical trials studying probiotics for traveler's diarrhea uh, are particularly very limited. Um, however, I was able to find one uh, meta-analysis that showed that a particular strain of Yee Saccharomyces CNCM I745 might reduce uh, the incidence of traveler's diarrhea by 19%. So travelers may, might be encouraged or, or thinking about prophylaxis, but also very important to counsel them, you know, the risks and benefits of, of doing so may not be uh, in their favor. Uh, next slide, please. Um, so how do we treat? So I've included a table of, um, of traveler's diarrhea from mild to severe. Uh, so mild diarrhea and, and is, is really, for most of the time, we, we recommend here at least to write it out, no treatment. And if it gets maybe a little bit bothersome, maybe some loperamide or bismuth subsalicylate occasionally, it's only when it gets more moderate, when a few more schools are passed per day, where the recommendation is a little stronger for loperamide or bismuth subsalicylate, but holding off on that antibiotic. Um, you know, there are the studies that I showed and the literature in general seems to be moving in the direction towards um, trying to hold off on antibiotics as long as possible uh, to prevent the spread of uh, resistant microorganisms um, and, and really only using them in, in severe cases. And this is where you would use your antibiotic if someone's having six or more stools a day um, and having very debilitating symptoms, fever, bloody stools, that sort of thing. That's an antibiotic type situation. That's a situation where you would really wanna avoid low paramide as we talked about and make sure that they're seen by a, a medical practitioner so that they can be stool cultured and, and treated appropriately. Uh, next slide, please. Um, so what do we do? How do we counsel travelers the what ifs? Um, if they are given an antibiotic, um, they should be taking it for no longer than 72 hours. Um, if they still have need for the antibiotic after that, it's time to see someone because likely it's an atypical pathogen. Um, if the diarrhea increases in frequency, volume, or severity, uh, despite appropriate treatment, that's also an instance for uh, referral or getting an antibiotic. High fevers, bloody stools, mucus, severe dehydration, all of these things uh, are, are instances where we would want to uh, refer or have them seek um, uh, medical treatment. Uh, next slide, please. So in closing, I, I know I've gone through a lot of information. When you sit down and talk with your patients about these things in general, it's a lot of information and sometimes is um, perceived as information overload to them. So one of the things I like to incorporate into all of my travel consults, regardless of what we're talking about, is the traveler's motto, which is basically if you can't boil it, peel it, or cook it, you should forget it. And so this is something that's very simplistic that people have an easy time to remember. If they can't boil their water for a couple of minutes, um, if they can't peel their fruits or vegetables, if they can't cook properly what they're eating, 
then they should probably, or that it's not served to them properly cooked, um, then they should simply uh, forget it. So that is the, the end of my presentation and thank you very much. Carl, that was fascinating. Thank you very much. There was really good detail in all your slides as there were in all the contributors' slides. Uh, we've just gone over time a little bit. We're just past half past the hour. So what I do know is I can see certainly coming in from the chat box that people are delighted with what they've learned today. I want to say to everybody, what we'll do is we'll just move on from the questions and answers and we'll go to a wrap up because the detail that's in the slides, I think is fantastic and people are going to be able to access them later. So on behalf of the well over a hundred participants who were there today, and on behalf of people who are going to retrospectively watch this and go through the slides, on behalf of everybody at FIP, I want to thank, I want to thank Carl, I want to thank Larry, I want to thank uh, Sheila, and I also then want to thank Derek as well on behalf of everybody for a really fascinating uh, insight into travel medicine and the role of pharmacists in helping people to understand better where they're going and how they need to be prepared for any of the eventualities that will happen them. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, it's not that far away from our International Congress in Seville, which has been delayed because of COVID. So it's a really exciting time for everybody at FIP. And I really do hope that as many people uh, who can make the time to get there, get there. The topics are looking to see that we're never going to waste a crisis, that we're going to look at the science and the evidence supporting the response to COVID-19 because let's remember that pharmacists were absolutely vital in being the open door and the accessible part of the healthcare system as it worked. And now what we need to do is look at how we're going to deal with the new and extraordinary ethical challenges that come from our ability to fight and to progress community pharmacy. There's an early bird registration, and that's until the 15th of July, and you will see the link to civil2022.fip.org is the place for you to go to learn, out, to learn more about FIP and about our World Congress. So all those future events, you will find them on the website. And ladies and gentlemen, again, thank you very much. And thank you again to our colleagues for a fascinating uh, talk today. And please enjoy your weekend.